Matt Reeves, The Batman, starring Robert Pattinson as the Caped Crusader. The Batman was in development for quite a few years, with many wondering exactly what this movie was going to be. First, it was rumored to be a prequel movie to Ben Affleck's Batman. Some sources claimed that Ben Affleck was involved in the project, and news about it was relatively quiet. All we knew was that Matt Reeves signed on to do a Batman movie in 2017, and no one really knew what the movie was going to be. Until 2020, when we started getting images, and eventually, a trailer at DC's Fandom event. Although the release date was still a mystery, because of obvious reasons. But finally, in March of 2022, the film was released released and was a great success, receiving some very positive reviews from fans and critics, and making a decent chunk at the box office. Which I'm actually surprised that it made this much, considering this is the third version of the character we've gotten in 10 years. When it first came out, I really enjoyed it, and I thought parts of it were done very well. And overall, I like the direction they took the characters, and the world that they set up here. And it's confirmed that Warner Brothers and DC are building upon this movie, with spun-off shows already in the works, Paul Dano working on a tie-in Riddler comic, and I'm more than certain that a sequel will be in the works soon. I think Matt Reeves and his team did something special here, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I figured now that we're months removed from its release, and it's been available to stream and purchase, that I will take a step back and look at the movie with a more critical eye, and see how well it holds up, just like I did with my Spider-Man No Way Home video recently. Now, some of the stuff that I'm going to draw attention to are the things I noticed in my first viewing, or I'm just now seeing upon my rewatches. And yes, some of this stuff may seem like nitpicks, but it's kind of the point of this video, but stick around, because towards the end, I'm going to go over and highlight some of my favorite things about this film, and what I think it does well. So of course, spoilers ahead. So sit back, relax, and let's take a look back at The Batman After The Hype. So let's go over the basic setup of the movie. Basically, Batman has been doing his vigilante thing for two years, and now several politicians and government officials are dropping dead, with clues being left behind by the killer. So Batman teams up with Jim Gordon so they can find out how these murders are connected, find the killer, and put an end to it all. So clearly the biggest intrigue for the movie is the mystery. How are these victims connected? Why were these people killed? Who will be next? And who's the one doing it all? That's the hook, and that's what keeps people watching. And throughout the film, you get these answers, as well as several other reveals and twists involving other characters. So I think this is the best place to start, since that's what the main focus of the movie is. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you what these reveals are, and then I'll tell you why I don't think some of them work that well, and I find the way they were handled a little bit lackluster. So there are several twists, but here are the main three in the movie. Number one, Falcon was working with the police and the mayor to take out Maroney in the drug business, which gave him power over them, and basically made him the real guy in charge of everything. So all the people getting murdered are the ones involved in the Maroney case, who are all actually dirty and working for Falcon. Number two, Bruce's father might have gone to Falcon to have a reporter killed who was going to leak some personal information about his mother, Martha. This shatters the perception that Bruce had of his father, and shows that maybe he isn't the squeaky clean guy that he thought he was. And number three, it's revealed that Falcone is Selena's father. So these are the biggest twists in the movie, and I'm gonna go over my issues with all of them. So my issue with the first reveal, that being the main one with Falcone being in charge of the city, is really a personal one. And that's just being familiar with Batman's stories and characters. This reveal wasn't that impactful to me. I won't say I saw it coming, but I wasn't really surprised. Once all the pieces came together, and showed that Falcone controlled the police, the mayor, the DA, and how he helped take out Maroney so that he can take over the drug business, I was just like, yeah, that makes sense. Seems like something he would do. It wasn't a bad reveal at all. It's just one that I wasn't very surprised about. It definitely all made sense in the movie and in the context of that world, but I wasn't blown away by it. And again, that's mainly because I'm familiar with Batman, so this reveal just wasn't that shocking. Now, the other two twists actually share the same issue, and that's the fact that they're both really underdeveloped and are resolved pretty quickly. Not even 15 minutes after getting hit with the possibility that Bruce's father might have done some shady shit, it's immediately told to us by Alfred that nah, that's not true. Similarly with Falcone being Selena's father, once she finds out that Falcone killed her best friend, and she tells Batman that Falcone is her father, she sets out to murder Falcone to get her revenge, but then she's stopped by Batman and Falcone is captured. Boom, it's all introduced and moved on from in like 20 minutes. Now these two things aren't bad ideas by any means, they just feel very underdeveloped, and that's why I think most people don't enjoy rewatching this movie as much as other films. Not because they know the outcome and what the twist and reveals are, you can know the outcome to a mystery and still like rewatching it because you're able to pick up on more things than before. That's why the screen movies are so much fun to watch. It's fun noticing the details in each scene that all add up and make the reveal that much better. But here, two out of three of the reveals are handled pretty lacklusterly and leaves you wanting more. And honestly, it makes the middle section feel kind of like a drag because these two twists are revealed here and they're resolved like 20 minutes later before the Riddler gets captured. It kind of feels like filler in a way because it's introduced and wrapped up pretty quickly and doesn't have a huge effect on the overall plot. I mean, the stuff with Bruce's father affects him for like 15 minutes, but then he's kind of over it and it's back to business as usual. And it's just because the movie doesn't dive that much into 
to this stuff, and they introduced it so late into the film that I feel like they had to wrap it up quickly. It's like they wanted to bring it in to up the ante of the film, but they had to put it aside before the third act, when the Riddler is captured and the final stage of his plan is in motion. Now circling back to the main reveal of Falcone, I just wasn't blown away by it. I enjoyed it for sure, I like seeing all the pieces come together with each clue and murder, but it just wasn't the biggest revelation to me personally. Now the reason why I'm harping on these twists and reveals and the mystery aspect of it all is because that's what the movie focuses on, and even though they present some pretty interesting ideas, I really wish they explored these aspects more because it leaves me wanting more. The next major thing was a point of discussion for a while after the movie was released, and that was whether or not Riddler knew that Bruce is Batman. I actually assumed that he knew, but apparently he actually doesn't. This became a topic because the movie heavily leans towards Riddler knowing, with some messages and images in Riddler's apartment that makes it seem like he knows, but then at the last moment, when Batman and Riddler come face to face, it's kind of revealed that he doesn't actually know, which makes you question all the stuff that makes it look like he does know. I think it could have been conveyed better, because it really all points toward Riddler knowing, but this is all misdirection, because apparently he actually doesn't know even though it shows you all the stuff in the prior scene that makes it look like he does know. But really, it's just because he's super obsessed over Bruce Wayne, and he just so happens to be heavily influenced by Batman. Which I guess does kind of make sense, because he does try to kill Bruce Wayne, and when he's face to face with Batman, he does mention Bruce Wayne, but he's more so disappointed that they weren't able to actually kill him. But that's supposed to be the hint to the audience that Riddler actually doesn't know. But then you keep thinking about the stuff in the apartment and how it all just makes it look like he does know. It's actually really more annoying than anything else. Yeah, I really wish they just presented this information better in the movie, because as it stands, the movie really heavily hints that Riddler knows who Bruce Wayne is, up until the point where he actually doesn't, even though it looks like he would clearly know, especially with all the images and cryptic messages he has all around his apartment. Like I said, I wish they conveyed this stuff a little better. Next is Catwoman and Batman's relationship. I really wasn't feeling it. There doesn't seem to be any chemistry there or any form of romantic attraction or even sexual tension between them. And it tries several times, but I don't think it hits the mark. I remember when this movie premiered and people were obsessed with Zoe Kravitz and thought that she was so sexy and I was just sitting there thinking, I don't like women, partner. But seriously, I think she's fine as Catwoman. She was good at being that type of character who rides the line between good and bad, but is ultimately a criminal in her own regard, looking after herself. But I don't think there was a romantic connection between her and Batman. That aspect fell really short. And I guess I'll briefly talk about the Joker reveal at the end. I'm pretty indifferent to it, and I don't really care that much, honestly. I'm just burnt out on the Joker as a character. DC uses the character a lot, between the comics, the animated movies and shows, and obviously, live action. I thought it was a neat addition at the end, but I wasn't super excited about it. I'm actually happy they cut out this scene where Batman visits him in Arkham, because I'm just tired of seeing him. And don't get me wrong, I love the Joker. We've seen so much of him that I'm just burnt out on the character. But in regards to the Joker in this film, I don't hate his inclusion at the end. It is pretty interesting, but I'm not gonna lie and say that was mind-blowing. Like, I'm just indifferent to it. Now these next few are actually kind of funny, but since I'm being a nitpicking prick, let's talk about them. First is the penguin chase scene. While being pretty awesome, I do think it's kind of funny that Batman chases him, causes all this property damage, as well as easily killing people in this explosion, but once Batman actually catches him and he doesn't have the information he needs, he and Gordon just let him go. It's like, really? After all that? Penguin caused this giant car accident, all this property damage, the death of some people, but yeah, let's just let him go. That was actually kind of stupid. I don't care that much, but it is something I've seen people really not like, and it is actually kind of funny. The next little thing that made me laugh was this scene when Batman is in Falcone's club and the power is out and it's only being lit up by the gunfire. A really badass scene, but it's kind of funny that all the machine gun fire from different angles aren't even phasing him and he's just tanking all the hits. But also with all these bullets flying around, not a single one of these hit him in the face at all, which is kind of funny and very lucky on his part. Although it is weird that he's able to tank all these hits when earlier in the movie at the very beginning, he actually flinched when taking two handgun shots point blank. But now machine guns hitting him from multiple angles don't even phase him. Like I said, it's not a big deal, still a very badass scene, but also kind of funny. Okay, now this last one isn't one that I actually have an issue with, but it's one I've seen people mention time and time again, so I'm gonna mention it. And it's that Bruce Wayne here doesn't exactly put on a persona when he's out and about as Bruce Wayne. He's just as dark and brooding as Bruce as he is as Batman. And this actually doesn't bother me too much because I remember during DC's 2020 fandom event, during the Batman panel, they say that this is a Bruce Wayne who doesn't know how to separate himself from Batman. and doesn't yet understand the power that Bruce Wayne has, which explains why in the movie, he's disinterested in business meetings or anything outside of doing Batman work. I believe that in the next film, we're gonna to see a clear separation between Batman and Bruce Wayne, and certain things happen in the movie that might influence his decision to actually act like someone else when he's Bruce Wayne, or at least be more interested in the Wayne Enterprises business of things, like how he saw the renewal fund get taken advantage of. If he actually starts taking an interest in the business affairs, then he'll be able to prevent something like that happening again. But I can understand why someone wouldn't like Bruce Wayne in this movie, because he doesn't even try to act different when he's out in public, and doesn't put on a facade, which is something that most people expect with a Batman movie. Even though it was addressed in the interview, most people actually don't go out of the way to look at that information, so it's understandable. 
I think that'll do for all the issues that I have with the movie. Although I also like to mention, I do feel like this movie would be better if it was just a little bit shorter. Like I've already mentioned, at around the halfway point, it really starts to drag. The movie's a little under three hours long, coming in around two hours and 55 minutes, and I feel like it could be two and a half hours long, especially if they took out the two plot points with Bruce's father and Selena going after Falcone. If they reworked the middle section a little bit, it could easily be 20 minutes shorter. But as it stands, I think the first hour and a half is really strong, then it starts to feel like a slog for about 30-45 minutes, and then finally things start to pick back up again when Riddler becomes the main focus and he's captured. Also, this line from Catwoman is kind of funny because it feels so awkward. <laughs> Okay, after picking on the movie, I think it's time to go over the things that I enjoyed. Because despite all my issues, I do think it's a very good film. It's also very well made. So, let's transition and talk about the good shit now. Something's in my ass. Mm. Now, first and foremost, one of my favorite things about this movie is Gotham City itself. I love the dark, dirty, sleazy, dingy look of it all. It definitely feels like a rundown city. And I like how the movie shows a good bit of the criminal underworld by having characters like Penguin and Falcone. It really just makes the world feel alive. This is definitely one of my favorite versions of Gotham City, and I'm interested in seeing this world expand more in the spinoff shows. Next is the cinematography. There's some really great shots and sequences here, and there are really small things that I think are pretty cool creative decisions, even if they are used sparingly, like the POV shots, or these blurry out of focus shots, just a few small things to give it a nice little extra touch. And I really like the overall dark aesthetic of the movie. It just feels very gritty. And I'll use this opportunity to talk about the action scenes. They are pretty good and I enjoy them. Although I will say that the trailer ruined like most of them, because most of the film is actually very slow and detective based, and more focused on trying to unravel the mystery. But in the marketing material, they used most of the action scenes in the trailer. So when I saw them in the film, they were definitely longer, but unfortunately the trailers already showed me most of it. So even though they are good, I wasn't super surprised by them. I really hate when studios do that. But what I think is even better than the look is the sound. I'm not talking about the music, though it is pretty good. I like the main theme that plays in the trailers and throughout the movie. It's dark and ominous, but also a little epic. But what I'm talking about is the actual sound design itself. The subtle things that give scenes an extra oomph. And the movie has that. Whether it's the sound of gunfire, punches, gadgets, heavy footsteps, or car engines. It all sounds sharp and on point. And I like how just apparent and loud these things sound in some scenes. That just gives these things more weight and impact. I mean, what else can I say? The shit sounded good. Now as for Robert Pattinson's Batman, he's not my favorite, but I do like him. I like his look, I like his muscle car Batmobile, and I do like that we get to see a more detective side of Batman this time around. But I love how this Batman focus this film actually is. I think it's the most Batman we've ever actually seen in a Batman movie. I mean, he's only out of the suit a few times, but I guess this just shows how fixated and obsessed he is over the Batman vigilante work. I like watching him and Gordon work together to try to figure out these clues and riddles. They're a great duo. Yeah, I thought Robert Pattinson was fine, and I love seeing him do all the detective work in the film. But I want to shift and talk about the Riddler for a little bit. I've seen people describe him as being like a Joker knockoff here, but I don't really buy that. Because here, the Riddler very clearly has an end goal and a plan, but more importantly, he has a very obsessive personality and severe OCD. He's obsessed with Batman, and he's despised Bruce Wayne's entire life, and his brain just never stops, constantly thinking and creating puzzles and ciphers. He's also a very meek and unassuming guy who isn't a physical threat at all. Like, he's not threatening in the slightest, which makes the scenes where he is trying to be scary work so well, because you can kind of tell he's someone who's trying too hard, and it feels more like uncomfortable and unsettling than actually scary. But the last little detail that sells it for me is the fact that when he doesn't get his way, he has a temper tantrum. He gets upset that he didn't get his way, and the plan that he fixated on and calculated down to a T doesn't play out the way he thought it would, which is something I can see Riddler doing, basically turning into a big baby who didn't get his way. I actually like the flood and stadium section towards the end. I like how Riddler had one more trick up his sleeve, and his plan wasn't done just because he was locked up. I also like how Batman really couldn't prevent the flooding, but he could save the mayor and stop Riddler's followers. I know it kind of bothers people that Batman didn't stop his grand scheme or ultimate plan, but since Batman is still pretty new, he's never really dealt with someone this methodical in planning, so he's really just trying to keep up and do his best he can. So the whole movie is kind of like a learning experience for him, because he never ran into a criminal with this much strategic planning. So I really don't mind that much that he couldn't prevent the last stage of Riddler's plan. And I actually like that Riddler is inspired by Batman. I know that rubs people the wrong way, but in the context of the movie, I think it works pretty well. Riddler sees Batman doing his vigilante thing, trying to make a change for the city, and Riddler just goes, well, how about I up the ante? And also, it helps Batman realize that he needs to be like a better influence on people. Instead of just being vengeance and anger, he realizes that he needs to be more hopeful and inspire. I don't know if that's a hot take or not, but I really don't mind that aspect of the movie. And I mentioned this in the previous section already, but I just want to reiterate it here. I think the main plot line and mystery with Riddler's murder, and the reveal of being Falcone in charge of everything, was very intriguing and engaging. Everything revolving around that was great. The murders, the mysteries, the riddles, the clues. I think all that was handled pretty well. Although I do think halfway through the film it does kind of lose its way for a bit, but once it goes back onto the Riddler, it definitely picks up steam again. 
So that was Matt Reeves' The Batman after the hype. And after taking another look at it, my opinion remains mostly unchanged from the first time I saw it. But now that I've gone through everything, this is probably the best way I could word it. It's overall a really good film that has several aspects that are really great. But there are several things holding it back from being truly amazing. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's just how I see the movie. It's just so many good things in the movie, but there's just a few things that are really just holding it back from being as great as I think it could be. But as it stands, I really like the movie. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing more of the world that was established here. Now, I don't think this is Matt Reeves' best work. Work. That honor goes to his two Planet of the Apes films. But it's definitely a well made, very well put together movie, at least in terms of the actual filmmaking. But I would definitely like to see him come back for a sequel and really expand and build upon what he established here. And now it's time for me to ask you guys what do you think about the Batman? Now we're months removed from his initial release and the hype has died down. Is it the best Batman movie ever? Is it one of the best comic book movies ever? Leave a comment and let me know. And of course, we'll give a nice big shout out to the channel members. Me and you guys, we make an excellent team. If you're interested in becoming a channel member, click the join button down below and check out the perks. If they interest you, consider joining or not. It don't matter. None of this matters. Man, I am not gay. I have relationships with women. Sex with men. And I got news for you. That means you're gay. Oh. Oh.